Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 744th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Howardina Pindell, Adger Cowens, Amy Kong, Elise Armani, Gabriela Shapula, and Elizabeth Buey. We're thrilled to welcome poet Portland Houghton Harjo here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today's guests and host. Artist Howardina Pindell employs the metaphorical processes of destruction and reconstruction in her work, cutting canvases into strips and sewing them back together, building up surfaces in elaborate stages. Her later work has addressed social issues, among them homelessness, AIDS, war, genocide, sexism, xenophobia, and apartheid. She's taught at the State University of New York Stony Brook since 1979, and her works have been exhibited in numerous landmark exhibitions, as well as exist in many permanent collections worldwide. Adger Cowens was one of the first African-American students to earn a degree in photography from Ohio University in 1958 and furthered his education at the School of Motion Picture Arts and School of Visual Arts in New York. Following graduation, Cowens obtained a position assisting photographer Gordon Parks at Life magazine. Cowens has a storied career in cinema as a film still photographer on over 30 Hollywood sets and worked with directors like Francis Ford Coppola, Sidney Lumet, and Spike Lee. We're also joined by three co-curators of the exhibition, Revisiting Five Plus One, all of whom are PhD candidates of art history and criticism at Stony Brook. Curator Elise Armani's dissertation examines immigrant artist networks on Manhattan's Lower East Side in the 70s and 80s, demonstrating how artistic practices were intertwined with the cultivation of community-oriented spaces and resources in response to municipal and commercial divestment. She's contributed to projects at the Guggenheim and Tank Shanghai, among others. Curator Amy Kong is a Patricia and Philip Frost pre-doctoral fellow at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Her dissertation project examines 20th century Asian American artists and their relationship to land and landscape. Amy has contributed to projects at MoMA, the Getty Museum, and others. Curator Gabriela Shapula's dissertation examines New York-based women artists who explored the significance of their autobiography as a site for critical resistance against dominant art historical narratives in the 1970s and 80s. Gabriela has worked on curatorial projects at SF MoMA, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and MoMA. And our host for today, Elizabeth Buey, is a widely published critic and art historian based in New York. Her writing addresses alternative modernisms and spatial ontologies in Europe and North America in the 20th and 21st centuries. She's taught at the Whitney and at Fordham and is a contributing critic for the Brooklyn Rail. She's currently completing a book titled Beside Painting on abstract painting and perception. And with that, it's my absolute pleasure to pass it over to Elizabeth Buey. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much, Chloe. Um, I am your moderator for today. And um, it's my absolute pleasure to be in conversation with this amazing team of artists and curators. So uh, my job right now is just to give a little bit of structure for the conversation today. We are talking about an exhibition that's currently on view at Stony Brook University called Revisiting Five Plus One, but it has a precedent in an exhibition that took place in 1969 called Five Plus One. And we have three curators and two artists and me, which is to say we have a lot to cover today. Um, what I'd like to do is structure the conversation broadly so that we start with a word from the curatorial team about what the show is, how it came to be. And then after that, I'll turn it to Adger, who was the only one of the people in our conversation today who was actually there at Stony Brook for five plus one in 1969 to hear a little bit about that historic moment. And from there, I'll open it up more broadly to a conversation about Howardina's art, Adger's art, um, curatorial practice, and whatever it is that we might want to discuss in that remaining time. 
Um, but before I turn it over to the curators, I want to mention that uh, because revisiting five plus one takes place at Stony Brook University, where Howardina has been teaching since 1979, um, and the show comes just as she's announced that she's preparing her retirement, it is also a tribute to Howardina and all of the diverse kinds of labor that she has contributed to the art world um, in her long career. We know her certainly as an artist, but also as a teacher and a curator and a writer. And so I'd like to, as much as we can, weave strands of thinking about all of those different types of practice into the conversation today. Uh, so from here, this is where I'd like to open it up and turn it over to the curatorial team, Gabriella, Elise, and Amy. So just tell us a little bit about revisiting five plus one. Tell us a little bit about five plus one and tell us how the show that you curated that's up now um, came to be. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And just quickly wanted to say thanks to Chloe and Fong and everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for organizing and coordinating today's event. I'm really excited and for this conversation and um, looking forward to digging into our exhibition. So. I think it's first important to further introduce what 5 plus 1 in 1969 is to everybody who's joining us today. So 5 plus 1 was an exhibition of six Black abstract artists that took place at Stony Brook University in the fall of 1969. And Stony Brook faculty member Lawrence Alloway invited Frank Bowling to organize a show and Bowling, who served as the plus 1, selected five other artists. Melvin Edwards, Daniel LaRue Johnson, Al Leving, Jack Witten, William T. Williams, all uh, came to Stony Brook to present their work. At the same time that the exhibition was being planned, Stony Brook students were part of this nationwide fight for Black studies on college campuses. Mm -hmm. And the exhibition opened during the first semester of courses in the Black Studies program at Stony Brook. And Five Plus One was also co-sponsored by this new program. And while the exhibition has had a legacy as an important early grouping of Black artists showcasing their work and abstraction, with each going on to make important contributions to the field and being recognized in their own right, there is very little documentation and historical record that was preserved from the exhibition itself, such as what works were shown, how it happened, and who saw it. So with revisiting um, five plus one, we we wanted to engage this original show um, with these this sort of lack of archival information in mind. Um, but we also really wanted to think about its legacy and the sort of context in which it emerged, how it was received, and um, to think through this absence of archival material um, and sort of why it, it would be that a, a show this important would also sort of be this um, difficult to, to pin down. Um, so the sections of the exhibition that we curated for uh, 2022 um, focus on the historical record of five plus one, um, the establishment of black studies at Stony Brook and the black student movement as happening concurrently, not only at Stony Brook, but also um, at the various uh, colleges where artists who were part of the exhibition were teaching, in particular Frank Bowling at Rutgers, um, or Douglas College rather, which has now become part of Rutgers. Um, and then also thinking through in general, the sort of critical experimental space that university galleries provided for marginalized artists. And of course, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, the legacy of Howardina at Stony Brook. So revisiting five plus one brings together works from the same era, from each of the artists that were in the original five plus one exhibition. And this shot that we can see here um, in the slides is uh, actually great. Uh, representative of this and um, we're missing uh, Jack Witten and Frank Bowling's work which is would be behind us where we're standing um, but uh, that first gallery really shows all of the works by the original artists um, representative works from that moment of the late 60s early 70s um, but it also um, brings together uh, works by six black women artists working in abstraction that were chosen um, by and in consultation with Howardina who worked with us as a guest curator, the sort of plus one to a new 
um, five plus one selection. So really we worked through um, Adger's documentation of five plus one, a single review that was written by a Stony Brook student, Janet Bloom, and Bowling's own writing to assemble a reconstructed checklist of the 69 show, and then to sort of select representative works to both gesture to that show and also sort of rethink um, it and think about its legacy through working with Haradina. Is it true that it was impossible to identify, were you able to identify all of the original works, but not locate them or talk us through on the selection of the artists who represent the historic show? Yeah, so it's kind of a different um, <clears throat> case for each artist. Um, the first thing we did was actually just figure out whose work was whose, which seems like it would be easier than it was because um, given that it was this early experimental moment in their careers, a lot of the artists' works actually looked quite different than the work that they would come to be known for. Um, some like Loving were immediately clear. Um, and then from there, we did try to identify the exact works. The only works that we got quite close to identifying exactly were the um, Edwards, which we have, Gabriella can speak to, we have a, a sort of site-specific rendition of that in our show. Um, and then the Loving, we knew that it was part of this series from, 69. Um, and we have a theory for what exact work it is, but we aren't able to confirm it because the works were kind of interchangeable and not titled and we're working with black and white photographs and so on and so forth. So we think that the work in our show actually might be the exact one that was shown in 69, but we don't really have any way to confirm that. I think also too, um, we learned that William T. Williams had taken a section of the linoleum piece. So he showed two large linoleum um, works that were hung vertically on the wall. Um, and one of them was then uh, sectioned off and became the base of a sculpture that he showed in Larry Rivers' Some American History, an exhibition that happened in what would become the Mellon Foundation um, in 1971. 1971. Um, and that sculpture is titled George Washington Carver Crossing the DuPont River. May, 7, May 17th, 1954. And so that was an exciting discovery that something we could actually pinpoint <laughs> that was shown at Stony Brook. Though unfortunately it's a very fragile sculpture and because of our university budget, we were unable to bring it to Stony Brook. But in our um, catalog for the show, we do have a section called a reconstructed checklist where we pull from a lot of Adger's photographs, as well as a suite of installation views that are held in Frank Bowling's archive taken by Tina Tranter, which really helped to start to put the um, puzzle pieces together. Thank you for summarizing the both of these shows. And I think what we're starting to see here with this slide that we're looking at, which shows Adger's painting, as well as the reproductions of four of his photographs of the opening is the sense of the people who were actually in the space in 1969. And so now I'd like to turn to Adger and ask you to talk about that moment in 1969 and bring us back to it. Because as we know now from the show, there's, um, as Elise just said, there's one review of it. Uh, we don't have an extensive archive of the exhibition. And I'm interested not just in you know the exhibition itself, but for this audience, maybe you can talk us through what it was like in 1969 to be an artist. How was it different? Uh, on campus or in the city, um, and you know what what kind of work were you making then? Just take us back, kind of paint a picture of that moment for us. Um, well, there's not much to paint because there wasn't that much going on. Uh, African American artists weren't being shown; were not being shown. African American photographers weren't being shown. It was um, this was a surprise show as far as I'm concerned, because there had never been a show of African-American abstract work. Um, and at the time it was like, oh, really? They're gonna show this work? I don't, I don't believe it's gonna happen. You know, it never happened before. You went to galleries to show your work and a lot of times they wouldn't look at it. They would tell you, oh, um, you can deliver the box in the back, you know, or this kind of attitude on racism was just terrible. Um, nobody was being shown. 
you know, it wasn't a time where it looks like here that it's exciting and everybody's all happy showing the work. Not a lot of people showed up for the exhibition because a lot of people didn't know, you know, and I think that a lot of the artists kind of worked in private. They weren't really showing because there was no place to show. So when this show came up and Danny called me and asked me if I would, you know, go with him out here and take some pictures of him with his work and his sons, you know, and, and I did. And uh, I would have shot more uh, if I didn't know <laughs> that it was going to be an important show. But at that time, it wasn't important. You know, it was um, like, a, I think people considered it sort of a revolutionary act. Oh, we got to show some Black artists, you know, what are we going to show? Well, they didn't want to show red, black, and green. A lot of people thought that that's all Black artists did. So when it came to being abstract work, and all these guys were really, at the time, um, producing some phenomenal work but it just wasn't being shown. So it was a big surprise. And I went and I photographed. And um, these pictures, um, this is actually the first time we're seeing a lot of the pictures, you know, they were never seen before. In fact, I had a hard time finding them. <laughs> That's how long ago it was because people were not um, paying attention to any of the African-American artist shows at that time. There were no write-ups that were no talking about it. And if they did write about one or two shows, they always compared the work to some white artists, you know, who were famous uh, like Picasso, or this is reminiscent of this guy or that guy. It was never, this is our work, you know, and this is what it is at the time. And I think, the guys at this time were doing some really um, exciting and very abstract works, which later on became very important. But at that time, it wasn't important. So, Andrew, just tell us a little bit more about the conditions around refinding the photographs that you had taken. Do you know how many rolls of film you shot at the opening? Did you remember that you had them? Did someone have to ask you if you had them or? How did you find them? I'm just kind of curious to hear about the process of rediscovery. Well, I hadn't done anything with them. You know, I have a lot of photographs. <clears throat> and they were, I mean, they were cataloged all together. And uh, a few years ago, Frank called me and said, you know, he was doing a show and he wanted to use a couple of photographs from that exhibition. And so I said, oh, okay. So I sent them to him and then he found out I had more photographs other than the ones with him. So then some of the guys started calling me and say, hey man, you know, can I get a couple of shots from the show? I heard you had some pictures. So then I went and I got all of them together for the most part. And I started sending them out to the different artists who asked me if they could have a photograph of this or that or whatever. But that's how it all happened because they didn't have anything and nobody had any photographs and there was no write-up about the show. So I had these photographs, so I started sending them around to the guys. And that's how they came to be known <laughs> because they contributed the photographs, I think, to another show and somebody saw them and called me about this show. And my dealer, Bruce Silverstein, called me and said they want to use your photographs. They saw them and they were online somehow. I don't know. There was a show where they put them up, um, a show about photography at the time. And so he called me and then we got together. And that's how it happened. Because as uh, far as I was concerned at that time, I mean, those photographs were lost to me, I had to go looking for them because, you know, I had stacks and stacks of stuff and there had been no use for them before. So anyway, that's how they came to life. I think the photographs give a great sense of the friendships and the kind of sense of sociality at that moment between the artists who were in the show in 1969. And actually I, I thought I might read a beautiful quote 
that was included in the printed materials. It's something that Howard Dina wrote in 1972. Um, and it relates to the broader conversation that I hope that we'll be able to have in a few minutes about the different kinds of work that she's been doing. Um, but she wrote in 1972, and this isn't something that the curators included in one of the um, vitrines in the gallery. For the young women who wish to pursue a profession, painting being one of hundreds of possibilities, it should be a little less difficult as now there is a dialogue about the problems as well as action. Persistence for me has been the key. Persistence is not letting what others say I can and cannot do affect me, i.e. there are no women or Blacks in X profession, and it would be so hard that you shouldn't bother trying. The essential choice, is to be, the essential choice to be made is whether one wishes to be hampered by or not hampered by the limits of others' vision of what a woman is and can achieve. Uh, so persistence, we will be persistent in getting Howardina um, back, but as long as we're waiting for her still, which I think we are, um, why don't we talk a little bit about the question of abstraction, which I think is one of the obvious themes around which both shows turn and um, has been such a point of discussion since that moment, straight up until our present moment as we think about the types of work that different artists produce over time. Um, and I think, uh, you know, this is part of lar larger discussions about abstract art maybe appearing in increasingly complicit in systemic exclusions of artists of color in a white male art world that may have shifted in one direction or another over time. Um, and maybe, Adger, you can talk a little bit about this with us. I was really struck by a quote that the curators included in the catalog. You said, uh, quote, there's no difference between photography and painting. It's about your communication with form. And I know that everyone who was included in five plus one had different ideas about how politics and form interact. And I think maybe one of the lessons is that there is no essential way to think about that. Um, but you know, for you, Adger, it's about photography and abstract painting being about form. So what how do you think about that statement? Talk us through it. Um, we're looking here at an image of your painting Golden Future that is included in the, the current Revisiting 5 Plus 1. Well, it's all about putting things together. You know, whether you're making a visual uh, statement with paint or you're making a visual statement with photography, they both deal with form, line, and color. All art does. And I think the problem with abstract work, where I, I don't have a problem, people have, there's nothing that is representative there that they can see a dog, a cat, or a bird, or a plane, but that's not the most important thing to me. The most important thing is the emotion that you bring to the work, the energy. And I think if you get out of your own way, then that energy comes through and is translated to people. And they vibe with it, even though there may not be a recognizable thing, but color by itself is important. Color by itself is beautiful. You're drawn to color, even in photography and painting. But I think it has to do with any image that you're making, any, um, the visual image, you're dealing with those things all the time, light, form, and movement. And you put emotion behind it and uh, you've got it. So the, I don't see any, any difference. There's difference in terms of whether you're using paint or you're doing photography, but they both end up as an image. You know, this, the paint is dried, you know, it's set. A photograph, once you make that image and you make a print, it's set. And people relate to it, I think, light, in terms of light, form, and movement. You know, you know, the artist, you know, when you have um, transferred something from, I'll say, your spirit, you know whether it's going to work or not when you show it to somebody else. If you feel that you've touched that chord and you show it to somebody else, 
then they validate that you have touched that chord that I think is universal, and that is emotion and feeling. Uh, that's really great to hear. And this painting is amazing. I'd love to hear you talk more about this painting. Tell us how you made it. And Chloe, can we move to my um, detail if you have it? So uh, for everyone who's looking at this picture, we're looking at the edge of Edger's painting, which has a black frame on it. So that black bar that you see is a frame. It's really hard to see, but what I was trying to get with this photograph is the tacking margin of the painting itself, which shows us that the canvas itself is black. So Edger, talk us through some of the formal choices in this painting, uh, the paint, how you put it on, um, and also the choice to paint on a, a black canvas. Well, I always felt that black is all, all colors together. It's the other end, white is one end, black is the other end. <clears throat> People, you know, uh, don't relate necessarily that white is a color or black is a color, but they are, and they're very strong colors. And I think when you put color against black, it really, it really jumps. It really, you know, it comes together. Uh, and I use black canvas a lot at that time I was using. But there are about eight or nine levels of paint on this canvas before I combed on the final level. Now, I wasn't actually using a comb. Um, I just told people I was using a comb. I made some instruments out of sticks and I glued them together. I had popsicle sticks, I glued them together. And then the first combing techniques I used, I was using horse brushes, brushes that, you know, they manicure horses with because it's a round thing and it has a serrated edge and I can move it around. Whereas a comb, you, you know, you're going straight lines mostly, but I wanted to circulate more. So I use uh, horse brushes along with uh, paint, the underpaint, I kind of ground into the canvas and let it dry and then sanded it down so it was a smooth surface. And then I combed with this wooden thing that I made over top of that. So that's how, how it was done. And when I was doing it, it was, uh, it was very, um, how should I say, I felt there were energies in the room working with me, you know. Um, uh, it sounds kind of nutty, but I think when you are in the zone and you're working creatively, the spirit works through you, you know, and if you get out of the way and allow it to happen, sometimes you come back and you don't even know you've done something until you look at it. But this, I felt I wanted to say something about the future. Um, I think about, you know, the future in terms of how we are all hopefully going to come together. Um, there's only one blood and we all share it, you know? And I think that this painting for me is about the future. My, my golden future and everybody else's golden future. And that's what I see for the future, something that's golden and beautiful. Well, that's beautiful, thank you. But I want to be really nitpicky and ask you to explain how, so how many layers of paint are wet? When you go, you said you, you layer different, you work in layers of paint. Mm -hmm. Do you let them dry or do you yes. scrape over yes. multiple layers that are wet at the same time? No. You, okay. can't, you can't go over multiple layers that are wet. You can when you're combing, but you can comb and comb over it while it's wet. But you, once it dries, you can't, you can't touch it. So the movements have to be really precise in terms of, it's like a dance. You know, if you think about <clears throat> Jackson Pollock, the way he danced around throwing the paint, you know, and the movements of his body, this is another kind of uh, dance with the cones and the brushes. You have to make, you can't go over it 50, 11 times. You have to make a movement. It's almost like 
Japanese painting, brush painting. You, know, you make a, a move or two and that's it. You can't go over it again and again and again. So in laying down the first layer, uh, I had to put colors that I felt would work good. You can see here through the comb, you can see the gold and you can see the white and you can see the pink and the blue. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see all the different colors underneath because I wanted you to be able to go back and forth with the foreground and the background. You know, for me, painting is about the color. I wanted to use color as form as opposed to painting a picture of something or about something. I guess I was inspired a lot by Kandinsky's writings um, and some of the other great artists that I read. And it's all about, you know, the color and how you, how you utilize it. Last fun. very specific it's question fun. about painting. It's are you fun. painting um, flat or are you painting these on an easel? No, no. I've always worked on the floor. I've never worked on these. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing the process. It's something that I'm always very curious about when I'm looking at paintings in the gallery. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question also about, you know, it was interesting when we've, we first started talking about five plus one in 1969, and you said there wasn't anything happening, barely anyone came to see the show. Um, it makes me wonder, you know, who who are you making the paintings for? Did you have a primary audience in mind? Um, and I was also thinking of that question when I read John Yao's recent review of revisiting five plus one and hyperallergic from a couple of days ago that I think was linked uh, at the beginning of um, our conversation in the chat. And he wrote, um, let me see, I have a quote here. So he said that your your paintings might have inspired Jack Witten to develop a different technique for applying paint um, because this is before Witten started to use his squeegees and his combs. And that too made me think, um, you know, that's a question of influence and whether or not that's true. It gets maybe to this question of who you're imagining the audience is for your painting. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Well, <laughs> Being a photographer and having a hard time at that, painting for me was very private. I wasn't interested in showing painting. I wasn't interested in going to galleries and trying to sell my work. I don't deal very good with rejection. And that's all that was out there at that time. Um, and so I privately was painting because it was something I had to do. I wasn't interested in showing it. I didn't care who, you know, I wasn't interested in an audience per se. I was only interested in getting these images out of me, which related a lot to my dreams. And I first started doing the cone painting in Jack Whitten's studio. So, um, and he came to my studio and he saw what I was doing. So whether he, he was influenced or not, I think it, it had an effect on him because he was painting very much at the time like Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. uh, most of his paintings were like that. You see there's another one in the show that I don't know, that's kind of what, the way he was painting. And I think that when we had these talks and we had a lot of talks about, I had begun photographing water and I took some water photographs over and he looked at him and he said, I think you're on to something. I said, well, that's where I really got a lot of my ideas about form and African sculpture. The idea of being, you know, making these lines. There's African sculpture that has these forms. And that's kind of where I got it. So we talked about it a lot, in fact. And I think that he began to understand because I wasn't educated as a painter. I didn't have a degree, but he understood something that I think really lit a fire on him because his whole attitude about painting changed. You begin to paint totally from an emotional point of view. And he started using all different types of things. It wasn't using brushes anymore. He started painting on the floor, et cetera. Well, several painters, friends of mine, kind of used the comb a little bit, but that, that was fine because that happens. 
But I think that there was an influence with uh, several other artists when they saw these cone paintings because there was nothing like that out there at the time. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. As long as we're talking about Witten, maybe we can um, discuss a work that's in the show, um, a little known one, which is hung on the backside of one of the small freestanding walls in the main gallery um, on the other side of the Daniel LaRue Johnson. And it's um, this work on paper by Jack Witten. So Adger and maybe is Amy here if she wants to jump in, tell us the story of this work. Um, I guess I can get started by um, talking about, I'm not sure where Adra, oh here. Um, I um, had been visiting Adra's studio a number of times to, you know, talk about the show and talk about his practice and his photographs and asked about, you know, um, what kinds of works maybe they were exchanging amongst themselves. And Adra mentioned that he had this, a drawing by Jack Witten and one day, um, you know, pulled this out. Um, and it was just like an amazing find to have. And he told us the story of how um, he was able to receive this from Jack on their first meeting. So I don't know, Adra, if you want to tell more the story about, you know, how you were able to get this from Jack. It's like a really lovely story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I won't go into all the detail, but <laughs> he mine took me down to meet, had met Jack and said, I think you, you know, would like to meet this guy. I would like for him to, for you to meet him because I think you guys are artists and, you know, um, and he's working and he's got a nice studio in there and I'd like to introduce you to him. So I went down. At first he didn't want to meet me uh, and I didn't really want to meet him, but a woman was involved and a friend of mine. And so anyway, she called him, she said, well, I, I think he wants to meet you. So I went over and we immediately bonded, you know, talking about art and the whole concept and everything. So when we were getting ready to leave, he pulled this painting out and he wrote on it. I met a black prince today, visited me in my, at Liz Bernard Street and uh, he gave it to me. Uh, I had several other pieces of him, but he gave me this and I was, I was blown away because at first, when we first met, it was very, you know, male thing, you know, I don't you know, who are you? <laughs> Where are you being? Yeah. But then as we talked, and I guess I was there for half the day, man. It was a long time that I was there. And then he found out that I didn't live too far away from him. I lived on West Broadway and he was on List Bernard Street. So then I, I started seeing it more and talking and, you know, about paint and applying paint. And, you know, um, we talked a lot about direction. And I was trying to explain to him that I didn't, you know, I wanted to go a different way. I wanted to have something different to say with the paint. I didn't want to paint, you know, people. Uh, I wasn't interested in any of the past artists' works. I didn't want it to look like anybody else. I was interested in paint and speed. I wanted the paint to move. Um, I'm working on some different things now, but the whole idea of applying paint, I think Jack got the message that you know, because he was really leaning toward Jackson Pollock and that whole school. But he, he was very smart, very bright. And we talked about water, very much about water. And I gave him one of the water photographs that I had because <clears throat> water had all these forms in it to me. And that's kind of where I kind of got my um, start from water and African sculpture. What a great story. I think everyone would love to have been a fly on the wall for those conversations that you had early on <laughs> yeah, with Jack Whitten. So. 
It was interesting. But, you know, I, I liked Jack a lot, and I photographed him in his studio several times. I went back, and he started working bigger, and then he started making these, um, what he called them, um, what do you call them? He had a name for them, these big, long things where you could drag paint. But he had seen some of the paintings that I had where I was dragging rags across the canvas. I, I didn't have any, um, how do you say, I didn't have any education about paint and painting. I was, you know, flying by the seat of my pants. I just wanted to, to do something with my hands. And that's all. And I started the first paintings I did, I was putting paint on the floor and putting big pieces of paper down and picking them up, almost like Rorschach, you know. And my son, he was my one year old at the time. And my wife came home one time, he had paint all in his mouth and she had a fit. <laughs> but I was experimenting. I, I still experiment, you know, because I think for me, I don't want, I don't want anybody to say, oh, that's Adler style. I want to be able to continually change. The world is changing every day. Nothing stays the same. Why should painting stay the same? I think it should be, you know, every day you should try and paint something different. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that we might have Haradina back now. So what I'd like to do is, is check if that's true. Haradina, can you hear me? All right, well, uh, curating, I think, is, is complex. I started being in a museum environment when I was at Yale, and I was working as a graduate student in the Garvin Collection, which is now the British Collection. And they encouraged me to go into museum work. Uh, and I mean, there are all sorts of interesting things that I, you know, that happened that I ended up where I ended up. But as a curator in an institution, there are a lot of responsibilities, including dealing with loans, looking at new work, um, you function as a semi-registrar, you do um, cataloging, you do condition reports, you set insurance values, it's, it's, and of course you do exhibitions, uh, either of the collection or a loan exhibition. It's, it's a lot more complicated, um, but uh, to be the curator, let's say for the Venice Biennale, you are dedicated that to that particular exhibition. Um, so being a curatorial person is kind of complicated if you get into an institution or you work for a private collection. Um, I would say um, the curators who are independent curators have a lot more freedom because they're not uh, limited by the uh, institution's uh, requirements, I'll put it that way, where there may be a show you're interested in doing, but they don't want it to have you do it. So that has its limitations and you're much freer as an independent curator. Um, what I liked about the museum work was that you had hands on in terms of the work. You could see as an artist close up why archival materials are important because you see work that's been damaged with fingerprints, foxing, um, light, uh, uh, paper work being light struck. So there, you know, again, there's a lot more if you're in an institution as opposed to being independent. You're a lot freer if you're independent. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that's, your, that's your all process? I basically wanted to say, uh, oh, my own artistic process? No, sorry. I was gonna ask if you'd like to tell us a little bit about your thinking in selecting the artists that you chose for the inclusion in revisiting five plus one. Well, the reason why I chose them was mainly that they had been excluded in their mature years. Uh, we're starting to hear about some of them now. The person who really got the most exposure, actually two, Alma Thomas, uh, who lived in Washington, D.C., and what I loved about her that was that she worked on her kitchen table. So there wasn't that kind of uh, thing that artists get into about, oh, you have a loft, how big is it, whatever. She would do her work on a kitchen table and it was very strong work. Uh, also Betty Starr, I think well, she's from California, was also someone who got attention um, earlier. But um, the rest of the artists, and I had wanted to include Betty Blayton 
uh, Taylor. Um, the rest of the artists were just in the shadows. Showing Mildred Thompson her painting. Uh, I just wanted to say I, I love Mildred Thompson's paintings. Uh, I was hoping that we could get a painting, uh, but there was nothing accessible. She's one of the artists who is deceased. Uh, but her paintings were, were quite wonderful. I visited her studio, studio in Atlanta many years ago, and she had this huge, huge space. And she worked in a corner. It was, <laughs> it was funny because the space was the size of an airplane hangar, practically. Anyway, um, I chose her basically because of her painting. Betty saw her because of her uh, um, kind of assemblage work. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I'm trying to think of a, a Brown, Vivian Brown, that was so sad. She died so young. Uh, and they think it was from her supplies from the solvents because she didn't have a wall that went up to the ceiling and her studio was wide open so she would be sleeping in the fumes. Um, and that impossible is what uh, gave her the cancer. Um, but as a person, she was really a, a wonderful person. And you would only hear about her uh, within the black community, you wouldn't hear about her outside the community. The other artists, I'm trying to think, oh yeah, Mar Mary Lovelace, I didn't know her well at all, um, but I enjoyed the fact that she was an abstract artist because we, as abstract artists who were, were Black, were getting flack from both the community and a disinterest from the white art world. Um, um, the Black men were admitted in, just in bits and pieces first and the um, Black women of color are starting to get some recognition, but again, a number of the artists are deceased. So if, thank God, someone, you know, uh, preserve their work, have an estate that they will still get the recognition, although they are not there personally to enjoy it. Yes, here's Vivian Brown. I think she was living in Africa for a while. Um, Anyway, she she was, you know, working in a way that was considered, uh, like the rest of us who were abstract, um, to be kind of inconsiderate, but yet a black, black culture, but yet she did live in Africa, I think, for a while. And this is uh, the chiefs, which are um, the chiefs of a particular nation in Africa. Yeah. So really loved her work I was, as a person she was lovely so at the beginning of the conversation i asked adger to take us back to the beginning when he saw five plus one in 1969 and i know that Haradina, you didn't see it in person but i wondered if you could take us back to 1969 in your life what were you doing what were you making um and is it conceivable to you in any sense that you you could have been included in five plus one in 1969. In 1969, I was um, working for the Modern at that point. The issue of my work, uh, I was a figurative painter when I was at Yale, but it was slowly sort of changing. It became a little more abstract expressionism. Haradina, are you there? I'm here now. It's so okay. strange to keep going on and off and on and off. We can hear you now. Oh, well. Uh, what else do you want me to talk about? Um, okay. Well, why don't we, Chloe, maybe okay. we can look at this. No, I was just side. basically. Go ahead, Howard. I'm losing. Okay. 
Chloe, maybe we can put up the side by side of Howard Dina's two paintings. I, and if, I have no idea. I didn't. Go on. If, she, if Howard Dina is able to come back, um, so these are the two works that she has included in revisiting five plus one, an early one from 1968 and a more recent one from 2020. Uh, Howard Dina, if you can hear me. Yes. Um, okay, I would love for you to talk about these paintings, um, Plankton Lace and um, an untitled space frame painting. So oh, yeah. you're represented by two artworks, right? So I, please tell us why two artworks in the show and oh, er, anything else you'd like to share. Echoing. Well, the paintings that um, pushed me into abstraction, I got very fascinated by uh, Larry Poons's work. And I was also interested in the circle and the ellipse. Um, it, it, so the image doesn't show up, but there's like a framework in the background of a grid. Um, and it, it was like a big leap from, again, being figurative into abstraction. And I started to do things I called space frames. Uh, I also was allergic to oil and I had to move to acrylic and that enabled me to do these space frames. I just simply, acrylic's properties, it dries fast. It's not going to rot the canvas. I mean, there are all kinds of things. So you can directly work on it without gestoing it. And the plankton lace, this is a series I did and I really loved working with it. Um, I was very interested in, um, oh my goodness, a friend who was a docent at the uh, Natural History Museum took me uh, on a tour of an exhibition they did about the ocean. And she showed me uh, one of the displays which had live plankton in it. And for some reason, I was working with those shapes and forms. Uh, and then I called the color of, of water. Um, I was very touched by looking at sort of almost microscopic uh, organisms. And I used foam to make three-dimensional texture. And foam, of course, is not archival. So I then sealed it with jade blue um, so that hopefully that would prevent the air getting to it uh, so that it won't disintegrate. But I loved working with the textured aspects of that work. Um, it's a little bit, when you look at the one work, it's like you're looking into the canvas and with plank and lace, it's like you're looking at something coming out towards you. Um, anyway, so the work changes over time. Uh, I'm kind of revisiting some of my earlier work now. Um, and it's like there's a parallel in terms of sort of rethinking some of the old work and then um, growing the new work. It's striking that both of the works that you have included in revisiting five plus one are blue. Uh, we've already heard from Andrew about the importance of color for him. And I wonder if there's something particular about blue for you here. Does it have an association? Why these works for the show? Um, so talk to us a little bit about color. Well, I love uh, the color blue. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I took uh, Joseph out color course at Yale, even though he wasn't teaching it, he had a fight with them. So um, his assistant, Cy Silman, taught the course and you took the course with architects. So, you know, there was a different kind of mindset in the room. Um, I just love the color blue. I remember going deep sea fishing with my father when I was a child um, uh, off of the, um, the coast of New Jersey. Um, I remember Oh my goodness, the use of color in terms of like the Caribbean, that beautiful water. And it's weird because the water doesn't have fish in it, which I thought was weird. Um, I love the color of the sky, the uh, bioluminesc bioluminescence of uh, some plankton. So if you go out at night and you walk into the water, as the waves come in, they are this beautiful, um, just extraordinary blue, luminescent blue. Um, so I find it a soothing color to work with. And there are so many different blues. So you have a nice wide range to uh, choose from. And apparently if you paint your room in blue, you feel better. <laughs> I remember the 
some sort of uh, research done years ago, but if you painted your room yellow, that would make you feel terrible. <laughs> but anyway, um, blue has its, um, I think, very positive points as, you know, in being a very um, sort of healing color in a way. And there are also so many blues. I mean, a young artist can choose from uh, Thalo Sinai blue, uh, you can, uh, there's uh, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, Prussian blue. There are all kinds of blues that you can use, whereas some other colors don't have the same range. Um, so that's why I like blue. I always love the color. It's funny okay. because you associate blue with, you know, in children's terms, a blue for boys and pink for girls. <laughs> uh, I didn't think of it quite that way, but... Um, and this blue is like, a, it's a darker blue, but it's stained. These are uh, stained uh, through uh, the canvas. It doesn't come out of the just no gas that was used. In addition to color, of course, the show turns around. I, I was just going to say that in addition to color, of course, the show turns around the color of abstraction. Up a okay. Can you hear us now? Howard Dean, are you there? No, I can hear you. Okay, maybe then as I'm the last here. question. Okay, <laughs> maybe as our last question to you before we um, either open up to the um, audience for questions, or you know, I have some other other questions for the other people in the conversation as well. But um, why don't you tell us, you know, what is what does abstraction mean for you? Uh, what can abstraction achieve, and what aims you know, what aims do you decide to work abstractly for? Since of course you have also worked in figurative modes. Um, so it would be great to hear your th thoughts on abstraction in relation to the show. I'm afraid you disappeared. So I didn't get the question. Okay, so the question is just, um, We've just talked about color, and I think the other poll that the show turns around is abstraction. And so I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about what abstraction means for you when you choose to work in an abstract mode, because of course you also work figuratively. So the question is just to talk to us about how you use abstraction and what you think it can do. Well, um, I find working with abstraction kind of soothing and it also, uh, it's interesting that it involves time and emotional uh, feelings because every time you work with the canvas, you're going to have different things on your mind. Um, and for me, it's like a recording of time, um, you know, stretched out. I just, I enjoy it. I physically enjoy it. It's, the, it's a real pleasure to work abstractly because I'm working with my intuition as opposed to critical thinking where I think through a painting, uh, if I'm um, doing a theater painting. I mean, some paintings I've done have been both abstract and um, um, figurative. Uh, and then I've also used text. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm working abstractly now. Uh, I haven't uh, put any images in. Uh, however, I'm interested now. Um, I went to each years ago and saw all the basic stuff to go to Egypt for. And uh, my dealer, Doris Grennan, just came back from Egypt and that kind of reawakened my interest. And I have a piece that I sewed together that reminds me of mummy wrappings. And, and I haven't been able to touch it because I haven't known what to do with it. And then when he started sending me pictures of some of the places he's gone to, um, and then I bought some books on hieroglyphics, I might start working, putting in text, but it would be a hieroglyphic text, um, but it would also be on an abstract base. So, you know, I love research, you know, I love reading. Um, the other painting I'm work on, working on at home uh, involves spirals. Um, and I found that there are in a number of um, sort of um, archaic or many, many years ago um, where people have drawn in caves or whatever, that a spiral is also 
a possible theme. Um, I know there was an indigenous uh, a First Nation uh, site from God knows when, um, and there were spirals there. So um, I just, it's a, it's a form I've never worked with before. And um, I'm curious as to what will, how it will turn out. Um, with figurative, you're kind of bound to the object or to the person. And with figurative, the sky's the limit. Or not figurative, with abstraction, the sky's the limit, which is, I think, very exciting. So I enjoy working that way. Um, did you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And th thank you for sharing about your current work as well. Can you, I, I'm just dying to ask, even though I'm being told we need to move the conversation along, um, how long have you been researching hieroglyphics and what oh, kind of prompted you? This is recent. Uh, he just got back about a week and a half ago. Very He's recent. Sending me images. And some of them are places where I have been, you know, images from places I have been there. Um, but he showed me something I found interesting that they apparently set up a grid work. And uh, he sent me a photograph. It's kind of hard to see because you're not there and it's also subtle. Um, but it kind of aroused in me an interest in engage, engaging the grid. And also, I used text in the 1980s, sort of into the 90s, that I was seeing the hieroglyphics as text, which they, they are. And I remember as a child being dragged into the Philadelphia Museum because it was a mummy um, and caustic portrait, uh, Fayum period, and it looked like me. So I was, that was my first acquaintance with the museum. And then I would go back to the museum and I got very involved with the Duchamp collection there, which is kind of odd for, for a child, but I did. So museums have been, you know, a part of my thinking and um, the whole thing about Egypt started off when I was a little kid that this mummy um, uh, and caustic portrait looked like me. And that made me interested in Egypt when I was quite long, quite young. And then in the 1970s, I think 74, I traveled with a group of people and did the, you know, the standard tour going in the pyramids and Valley of Kings and so forth. And at the time, uh, Tut was in his golden coffin. They've changed that now. Um, but anyway, uh, I used to love travel, but I'm now handicapped, so I can't really do much traveling at all. Um, and considering what's going on in the world, I don't know if I want to do too much traveling. Um, I'm just, you know, really concerned about um, what's happening with our country. And uh, there are other, of course, things going on that are much worse. But anyway. Well, thank you, Haradina. I um, am really reluctant to cut this conversation short. I feel that we could continue hearing from Adger and Haradina for at least another two hours, although I won't expect you to stay that long with us. Mm -hmm. um, as a closing question, just to bring it back to the current exhibition, um, why don't I loop the curators back in, Elise, Gabriella, and Amy, and just ask for any reflections that you have on the curatorial process and also working with Haradina, and then we'll open it up to see if there are any audience questions after you answer. I guess, <laughs> go ahead. I was gonna say, I can start us off about just the curatorial process if you're talking about that some. Um, you know, working collaboratively made a lot of sense for us with our timeline. And it was just a really, um, you know, wonderful opportunity to get to work with Howard Dina being someone who is um, here on our campus. Um, but at least go ahead. <laughs> no, I, yeah, it's been, it's been such a, a wonderful um, opportunity to work with Howard Dina and to work together with Amy and Gabriella. Um, yeah, as Amy said, it, it only made sense to work collaboratively and it really was, this whole process has been a process of sort of discovering, um, and we've been fortunate to have, you know, this, the original five plus one having happened at our campus in Stony Brook and, and to be able to sort of continue to re-engage resources that are in our immediate um, context, be they having, you know, the incredible Howardina Pindell on our faculty um, 
and you know having incredible advisors to the project like Katie Siegel on our faculty and and being able to dig into you know sort of the micro history around us so it's, it's really been a pleasure um Gabrielle I don't know if you want to add yeah I mean I think the thing that's been such a joy about working on this exhibition is the ways that we've really put all of our artists at the forefront including Adger and those who are still with us from the original show Melvin Edwards and William T Williams were so generous with their time um, over the summer when we were preparing for our book and our exhibition and so um, this thinking back to what five plus one was it was very much an artist centered exhibition of let's get together and show work on our terms and so that felt really important as like a guiding framework for then when we approached revisiting the show and so working with Adger, working with Howard Dina, it's just been such an honor and a real pleasure to kind of bring this all together and now be on the other side to talk about the different things that this exhibition provokes or offers. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, this is where I'm going to turn it over. Uh, but I just also like to say thank you so much to the audience for joining us today and also for your patience as we worked through our connectivity issues. Um, so Chloe, I'll send it back to you um, for questions. Wow, thank you so much, everybody. That was amazing. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Howard Dina. Thank you, Adger. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Elise. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. The first question is going to be from Megan Liberty. And Megan, I am going to give you uh, the chance to unmute to ask directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask on Megan's behalf. Um, the question is, I'm curious to hear more from the curators, Elise, Amy, and Gabriella, about your research process, especially in the absence of clear archives. So how did that process start? Paint us a picture of how it started and what leads came up as you were trying to reconstruct the exhibition that you maybe haven't talked about yet. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think throughout the whole process, we were con constantly feeling like we had like nothing to go off of. And now looking back after, you know, having worked on the research for a year and then having the show up now, I'm like, we dug up a decent number of things. But um, the traditional things that you would want to start with, like an archival folder on the show with like a checklist or correspondence that, um, you know, we have for other shows that we've looked at, there really was um, nothing, unfortunately, in, you know, the Alloway papers and our campus archives, etc. So, like I mentioned before, we had this one um, very poetic, but um, not super, like, specific review about the show by this student, uh, Janet Bloom. And then we had address photographs, of course, which we started with many fewer than we ended up um, gaining access to through working with Adger. Um, and then we had the really fantastic cooperation of the bowling studio and Frank Bowling's archives, um, as well as conversations with other artists. But um, everybody sort of had, an, had, had a lack of, of materials immediately available. So we kind of decided that because there was not um, a sort of core source of information that we would build around the show. And so that sort of led us to these other camps of research that really ended up shaping how we framed the show, which were like thinking about this moment for Black artists in the 60s in general and the sort of divergences between the Black arts movement and abstraction, um, thinking about university campuses and the Black student movement and also the space that campuses provided for artists, um, and also digging into the sort of history of the arts at Stony Brook and Alloway's legacy there and the relationships between the specific artists. So we kind of looked at the whole that was the show and tried to create as much as we could around it to then have some of that allow us to then make our own um, arguments for what we think happened um, to sort of fill in some of the record that that is missing. And I would just add to that too that um, Frank Bowling is an interesting figure as an artist and writer and in the many years following the exhibition, he would continue to write about all of the artists that he that were included in Five Plus One, um, as well as reflecting on Five Plus One itself. And so 
there were two different articles that stood out to us that really helped to push us forward in the research process for the show. One was where um, bowling reflected on the specificity of the university campus of a uh, context of black students clamoring for more black studies and that's a almost semi accurate quote um, from this <laughs> from what I remember um, from an article titled the rupture. And then another article where he reflects and refers to five plus one as a admittedly all male club grouping of artists a kind of convenient grouping and sort of noting how it grew out of uh, an immediate moment of exchange close social circle of active debates and so that naturally meant that um, there were no women included and so those two finding those two pieces of his writing really helped push us forward and um, developing the show and our revisiting of it and understanding the greater Stony Brook context but also in um, engaging Howard Dino, which we already wanted to do, but this just further pushed us forward in that aspect of the research and development. Thank you so much for those very rich answers. And thanks for that question, Megan. The next question is going to be from GE. GE, I'm going to allow you to unmute. Oh, thank you so, so, so very much. Um, and thank you for this history, both then and, and now. Um, because none of these pieces of art are, are made in any kind of, of a vacuum, are there any efforts uh, to further activate this space with lectures and performances? Um, so we haven't been having any like programs in the space itself, but we have already had um, a number of programs. Just this last week, we had a program speaking to um, the, uh, the the black student alumni on um, our campus, and so that took place, you know, in, in conjunction with our exhibition. We were looking at um, we invited like five alum, alum who were part of um, you know the beginning of Black Studies at Stony Brook and the beginning of the Black Students um, United Club. Um, in terms of other types of um, like programs that are coming up, we have one in March um, that's still kind of in the TBD process, so we'll be able to update you on that. Um, but most of these things aren't happening in the actual physical space, I guess, you know, the Mel Edwards curtain kind of limits, I suppose, um, where people could, uh, you know, sit or stand. Yeah, it definitely serves its purpose as an intervention in the space. Um, I will add, um, that as Amy mentioned, we don't have the details totally pinned down for the uh, program in March with Haradina, but we are hoping to specifically engage with some of the artists that she has um, played a really influential role on as a, as a teacher um, in her years at Stony Brook. So um, there will be some of that thinking about art not existing in a vacuum and the sort of ripple effects of these works um, for that program. So um, hopefully we'll have more details to share on that in the coming weeks. Thank you so very much. Thanks for that amazing question, GE. Um, the next question is going to be from Helen Colton. Helen, I'll give you the chance to unmute to ask. Hi, thank you for taking my question and um, telling us about this wonderful historical moment and um, revisiting it. Um, my question is in the 60s and the 70s, um, since museums and um, institutions, um, galleries weren't really showing a lot of Black artists, um, was there efforts in the within the Black community to create opportunities for themselves? Like I'm just um, learning about this collective called Where We At Black Women Artists that formed in 1971 in New York City. And I'm curious if anyone has information about that. It's kind of an obscure thing that I just stumbled upon. And I'm curious about other efforts in that way, or perhaps if Howard Dina had any contact with this collective, um, which showed in Greenwich Village, I guess? Um, I was kind of out of out of it because I was not from New York. Um, and I was originally from Philadelphia. So some of the groups that formed, I was not part of. Um, I did uh, later hear about where we at, but there was also um, a women's African American woman artist group that um, I think it was the 1980s, maybe. Um, and it was called Entitled, the E-N-T-I-T-L-E-D. And we had a large, large mailing list. And we tried to keep up with a, um, 
a kind of publication which listed you know, exhibitions uh, or would say, well, this exhibition has no women in it or no people of color, whatever. Um, and that lasted about two or three years. Um, but being not from New York meant there were many um, activities that I was not included in, partly too, because some people were um, uh, suspicious of me because I did work at the Modern. Um, I know I had one white male curator who was a former museum person call me up and scream at me, calling me a whore for working at the Modern. So, you know, I, it wasn't a total welcome mat when I went there in terms of it being an unwelcome mat um, on the outside. And sometimes on the inside, there was an unwelcome mat, mat, mat because I think Keniston and I were the only two people of color there. When I arrived, he wasn't there. So I was the only um, woman of color. Uh, but there was a Native American artist who they later got rid of when they went through with a new director and just simply took people out of departments and fired them for no reason. They just wanted a smaller staff. Uh, I believe that's uh, the story behind it. So uh, I don't know. I enjoy curatorial work. It's very um, nice to be that close to the pieces um, and to learn about how my work would be harmed by mishandling the materials. Um, but I don't miss it enough to want to, after I retire, go back into it. <laughs> anyway. Well, there were several groups um, of artists. Uh, in fact, I was one of the founding members of uh, Kamonge, which started in 1963. And we just recently had a show that started in Virginia and then it came to the Whitney and then it just finished at the Getty. Now we were together in 1963. There was also another group called Africobra, which started in Chicago with the Wall of Respect. Uh, I knew the where we at women artists. I knew a lot of them. We were friends. And there was also a way you see which was another group of African-American artists who started in Harlem. And uh, where you see just had a show of their work over the last 50 years. So there were other groups. There was a group of women in Atlanta photographers. Um, there were several groups around, but um, they would come and go. But Kamonge lasted for many years, and so did uh, Africobra. Uh, in fact, uh, Nelson Stevens, who just passed recently, they're doing a big show of his work in Springfield where he taught there. So there were groups, and I think at that time, then you had the Studio Museum in Harlem that started, which was, um, you know, new and a place for African-American artists to show works. So there were things that were going on in the community. And there were a lot of people who were starting uh, their own galleries. You know, uh, Peg Austin started a gallery to show work. There were several uh, people who were trying to get up and running and get in on this game of African-American art and collecting. And then there are many uh, collectors. There's a gallery in DC, there's, there's several. Uh, um, um, galleries and museums. There's a museum in uh, Philadelphia that I've worked with, African American uh, Museum. And now there are a lot of places where you can find uh, African American museums almost in all, every major city now. So there is a lot that we kind of did on our own, but the major uh, focus of uh, African-American art in major museums is still underserved. Thank you so much for that amazing question um, to close our Q&A. Um, and thank you all again for this incredible conversation. At The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Portland Houghton Harjo here to, to the stage. 
Cortland Houghton Harjo is a Muskogee and Seminole writer from the elusive state of Oklahoma. Her work can be found in Beaver Magazine, Yellow Medicine Review, and the Creative Field Guide to Northeastern Oklahoma, among other publications. Harjo worships Bigfoot and the natural process of decay. She's currently based in Brooklyn. Please join me in welcoming Portland. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Adger, and thank you, Howard Dina. Um, thanks to the folks at Stony Brook and, of course, at the Brooklyn Rail. Um, to close, I'm just going to read um, a poem that I wrote after the album Illuminations by Buffy St. Marie. Kind of, I feel like, aligned with the idea of abstraction and also social political politics. Um, yeah, this is After Illuminations by Buffy St. Marie. Oh, mama's stuck with sagging dreams. Buffy St. Marie opens up the rib cages of weird native girls and pulls our heartstrings to pluck, pluck, pluck up and down. I look at my tits dance when I move and how their heft makes them sag and sway. We are good at making the darkness danceable. I feel a dreamscape's heartache when I look down at my chest. There are conversation starter for the men I pass on the street, for the counter guy handing me a green juice. They're a monument to pray to. Flesh itself is magic and flesh writhes. So we move away from the sun. I wanna take the scissors Miss St. Marie handed me and cut my breasts out, a newspaper obituary clipping, but I've made a treaty with my body to keep it together. I wanna shove the word treaty down my throat until it hits the acid in my stomach and I've saved Indian country from treaty and I've freed us from sagging tit dreams. This dream tree is the only thing blocking the sun from my reddened skin, tender and raw. I wanna click and pluck and crispin my words and ripen my tongue so it can move like Miss St. Marie. Guttural, unrelenting undulations. I show these dudes my teeth yellowed by the coffee I drink and the shit I talk. And when I show them, I'm saying, this is where I come from, not from Oklahoma, but from illuminations, from the dream tree, from the gasping, grasping breaths of native women and their dyed hair and their drugstore lipstick and their warm, mournful, insulting odes of love. I want my teeth to be the silver capped story of them all and my hips will tell them how I was born and who raised me and the fry bread I eat and the great dumplings I have on special occasions like funerals and wakes. You can't have death without something sweet. You shouldn't have death without an auntie making a joke or serving you food or rubbing your back as you set down her sweet tea and listen to low stringed voices singing hymns in a language you aren't fluent in. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Portland. That was amazing. Thank you for that reading. Um, thank you again to Elizabeth. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Adger. Thank you, Howardina. Um, what an incredible conversation today and reading to close um, an amazing event. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you as well to Karen and Katie at Stony Brook University for their support in preparing for today's event and with technical difficulties today. And we'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring this program and making daily conversations like this NSC possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events, like our daily NSC. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the Rail. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., you can join us for a conversation with artist Brenda Goodman, hosted by Ksenia M. Sobaliva on the occasion of Goodman's solo exhibition at Sikkima Jenkins' Hop, Skip, Jump. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Amanda Monti. And as is real tradition, you can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for joining us today and for this incredible conversation. And I say one thing? Yeah. I would like to make people aware of my book, latest book. You can find it at 21st editions. It's a different book. All the pages are black, but it's an all book of photography abstract and it has water. So if you go to 21st editions, you can find the book. It's my latest book. Love it.
Thank, Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How was everyone? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much for the reading, Portland. Good job, Amy. Thank you. Great job, Elizabeth. If you can make it out to Stony Brook before March 31st, go see the show. Thank yes. you. Oh, yes, please. Congratulations. Bye. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you. Elise, Amy. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great weekend, too, OK? Thank Bye. you. You too. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.